Now, I remember John has said earlier, we, we, two weeks ago, we, John has said, you know, I, I, I saw Jesus, I was with Jesus, I heard Jesus, I'm, I'm testifying, I've got good reason to say what I'm saying. <laughs> and from that personal account and personal association and plus inspiration, he, he begins to say some things like he's going to say tonight, and these are powerful words. This is a message we heard from him. Now, John is saying, this is what we heard from Jesus. This is, this is what we, we were taught. And we declare it to you, what we heard. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Now that is absolutely fundamental to all of our understanding. And it may not sound like it means very much, but it's fundamental to all of our understanding of Scripture. What does it mean that God is light? Pure, he's sinless. All right, he's pure. He's sinless. He's holy. Uh, and when it says there's no darkness in him at all, what does that say? That, that he, he, he's pure and he's sinless and... And so you have God's holiness, and He's perfect in every single way. And John says, this is what Jesus taught us about the Father, what He taught us about God, that He's absolutely holy. He's set apart. Are His ways higher than our ways? Uh, there's nothing about God that can lie, that can deceive, that can do anything wrong. There's no darkness in Him at all. Now, Man has a problem. And what's man's problem? Sin. 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 <clears throat> man has a problem, and it's called sin. It started way back at the garden, and as soon as that sin took place, and it may have been a long time after the garden was built, and after Adam was put there, we don't know how long that all went on, we don't know how long it was before Eve was created. We don't know how long they were together. But finally, they did what condemned the world. Their sin condemned the world so that now we're all guilty of sin. And if God is holy and pure and perfect in every single way, what kind of fellowship can He have with darkness? None. Not a single tiny bit. He just can't do it. <clears throat> and so, as the Old Testament teaches us, that when man sinned, he was automatically what? Separated. Separated from God. That's why Adam and Eve had a practice of walking in the garden in the cool of the day, having fellowship with God day after day for all this long period of time. And then they committed this crazy sin, and God does what? cast them out and fixes them where they can't get back in that garden ever again. They are separated from God. Now, that's what he's trying to explain. God is light. In Him is no darkness at all. And if we claim to have fellowship with Him, and yet we walk in the darkness... We lie, and we're not living by the truth. Now, that's really confusing if you don't really stop and think about it. If I claim that I have fellowship with God, and yet I keep walking in the darkness, well, that, that really bothers me because just in a few verses, he's going to say, if you try to tell me you don't have any sin, I'm going to tell you you're a liar. Everybody messes up, and everybody sins. Is that right? So, how do I reconcile this? God's grace. Okay, God's grace. How, how did God's grace show up on this earth? Jesus. Through what? Jesus. Through Jesus. All right, God. Why did Jesus come? We, we talk about Jesus as... Often, and we ought to be talking about him every single time we gather. Why did Jesus have to come? 
We're, we're now in John's gospel. The same writer wrote years before that gospel account, the story of Jesus, and we're, we're at the point of that gospel where he's, he's about ready to be crucified. Now, it's going to take us, at the rate I'm going right now, I, I, I may not have any hair when we get finished with John because it's, it, it, it's, it's taking us a long time. I mean, last Sunday we covered one verse. We were two months in John chapter 13. There are, there are powerful words left. But why did Jesus come? Because He loved us so much that He came. He couldn't stand the thought of us not being in heaven with Him. Okay, now that, that, so He had to die on the cross so we could go to heaven and be with Him. All right, He loved us, and God the Father loved us, and God said, "I, I created these people, and I created these people in My own image." You are exceedingly special. Every single one of us in this room is exceedingly special. But just remember, you're no more special than anybody else. Okay, that's where we get ourselves in trouble. Everyone is really, really important. Everybody's really, really special. But no one is any more important than anybody else. Everybody got that? Can't ever afford to forget that one. But God looked at this and said, I created them from the dust of this earth, and now they're separated from me. That wasn't my intent. That's not what I wanted. I love them, and I love them so much, I've got to figure out a way whereby I can have them to have fellowship with me. And there was no other way. What kind of sacrifice would it take to satisfy the holiness of God? One, uh, uh, one without blemish. All right, one without blemish, one that's perfect, and the only thing he could figure out was his own son. That's the only thing he would be satisfied with. And so Jesus came and Jesus died so that he could be a mediator between God and us. And so that he could be a reconciler, that he could bring us together. And that's why we preach so frequently or talk so frequently. Don't even know if I like the word preach. But we talk so frequently about the kingdom of God and being a part of the kingdom of God and entering into the kingdom of God as a new what? Creature. New creature. Now, what's significant about the new creature? <coughs> when the person becomes new in Christ, what's, what's the most significant thing about that? All right, their sins have been what? They've been washed away. And so that's why we keep talking about if you're going to follow Jesus, then you're going to have to make up your mind, all right, I'm going to try to not live like this world lives. I don't like how the world lives. I know it's not right. And, 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 and I, I go down into water and I'm being raised up and I say, I'm this new creature. My sins are washed away. And they're washed away not by that water, but by the blood of Jesus. Everybody got that? And God looks at us and says, you're mine. You're mine. My design has worked. I brought you now into my kingdom. And if you are in Christ, like I've just described, you try not to do what? Walk in what? Darkness. Walk in the darkness. Now, it's easy in this world and easier right now than it's been in any time in my lifetime. I can't speak of Corinth. I can't speak of days in, in, in the 1400s. I don't know anything about that stuff. But in my lifetime, it's become a darker place than I've ever known. Is that true for you? The, the darkness is everywhere. And I'm getting tired of it. And I'm getting so tired of it that I don't even want to think about it. And in some ways, I've become apathetic. So when you talk about, Ken, have you watched the news lately? I'll probably say what? No, no. I'm not watching it. 
I might read a little bit on my phone, but I just don't want to watch it. I don't want to hear these people yelling at me and, and trying to tell me this stuff because I don't know if I believe anybody anymore. <coughs> and, 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 and while at one point I was so strong thinking this, this political thing ought to happen, this political thing ought to happen, this, now I've decided that nobody's telling us the truth. And, it, and I get aggravated with it. And, and I, think, I, I think there are things going on that for a long time where we haven't been told the truth. And uh, so it's all out there. It's, it's all this, this darkness that's out there. And it's easy just to say, I'm tired of wrestling with it. I'm tired of fighting. And I just walk off in the darkness and stay there. Is that what Christians are supposed to do? No. 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 That's what he's saying. If you claim that you are in Christ, if you claim that you are walking in the light, if you claim that you are in God, and you have fellowship with Him, but you, you walk in darkness, you just willfully go out in the darkness, uh, you're not... You're not you're not living the truth. You're lying to yourself and you're lying to everybody else. Does that make any sense to you? We have to take seriously the fact that we become God's people. Now, does that mean that we live perfectly? Has anyone lost their temper this week? Or come close at least? Has anyone said something about someone they shouldn't have said? Yeah. Has anyone, and you, know, you see how this, where we can go with this? Anyone had a bad thought? Anyone, you know, it just keeps going. And we all sit here and say what? Yes, yes. I mean, look at Carol. It's written all over her face. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> no, it's a joke, Carol, okay? <laughs> but my point is, we, we, but that doesn't mean we're walking in darkness. That doesn't mean we're just out there wallowing in, in sin. That, that, that doesn't mean we're, we're living an intentional double life, does it? I mean, I, I was with a person not very long ago, and he told me the story of a man who was living an intentional double life, and by that he meant he has two separate families and has just been exposed. I mean, I can't keep up with one. I don't know what I would do with two, okay? Uh, but he was living a total double life. That's what this is talking about, that I claim that I'm in Christ, but I'm living another kind of life at the same time. I mean, I would be living... Lately with, our, with, with Ravi Zacharias. Yeah, Ravi Zacharias, uh, a, a person from India who became world famous, literally world famous as a Christian speaker, author. Uh, I mean, they had him on the campus of Oklahoma Christian. He filled the gymnasium from wall to wall, only to learn a little later that he was living a total double life. Uh, we're not living living double lives, okay? That's we're not. That's what this is talking about. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light. Now this is this is one of the most quoted verses we we have. If we walk in the light, as he is in the life, and we have fellowship with one another. And the what? The blood of Jesus, His Son, what? Purifies us from all sin. So I'm not fellowshipping the world. That means I'm not, I'm not living a double life. But let me read this next, next verse back so you get this. 
If we claim we're without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth's not in us. Now, now do you, you see how that works? Earlier he said, if you claim you are, you have fellowship with God, and you're walking in darkness, you're, you're, it's a lie. Now, on the other hand, if you claim you have no sin, it's a what? It's a lie. Is everybody getting this, what I'm trying to say? I mean, it sounds like I'm doing double talk. And I can do that pretty well, by the way. But I'm not. There's a distinction here that's very, very important. And the distinction is, we're really trying to walk in the light. You wouldn't be here tonight. Well, you might. You might come eat the chili. I don't know. But, but you probably wouldn't put forth the effort to be here tonight if you weren't trying to walk in the light. And you probably wouldn't be trying to control this or that in your life if you weren't trying to walk in the light. But even when I try to walk in the light the best I can, I end up what? Falling down, messing it up, stumping my toe, uh, doing something I shouldn't do, and, and so forth. But if I'm trying, and I'm living by faith, and I'm moving forward, the blood of Jesus keeps on what? Keeps on cleansing me. And so as I approach the end of life, and sometimes you don't get to approach it, it just comes like that. Donnie has seen it come like that many, many, many times. He's, he's pulled up with that cruiser, that police cruiser, right behind the wreck, and, and they're gone. And they were gone instantaneously. Others of us perhaps approach it very slowly. And we can feel it coming, and we can see it coming. And, uh, but we don't have to be afraid of what happens on the other side. I mean, this Sunday, I know, I mean, I need to talk to Burke about the slides. I meant to do that a while ago, Burke. Because I, I'm just going to go from verses, verses 2 and 3 in John 14, where he says, In my Father's house are many rooms, are many, in the King James Version, what is the word? Mansions. Uh, I, I've told you the truth. I wasn't lying to you. That's where I'm going when you're wondering where I'm going. And I'm going to get one of those rooms ready for you, and I'm going to come back and get you. And so I think we're just going to talk about heaven. What does it look like? I think we're going to end asking the question, do you want to go there? Is that a place for you? And now I've said enough that you've got the idea, so Sunday you don't have to come. You know? So, so Sunday you can just skip out because I've already kind of given you the... But we're going to try even to slip over in the book of Revelation and, and just see a little bit of what this heaven really, what we got to look forward to. And I'm going to tell you Sunday, it's not Casper the friendly ghost flying around. It's real bodies and it's real people and real rooms and, you know, and, and so forth. But as we approach the end of life, according to this formula, do we approach it fearfully? And do we approach it uh, um, with un uncertainness? Now, be careful with this. Be really careful. It doesn't mean I approach it wanting it to happen in the next few seconds. Okay? That's not what I'm meaning. Because we have built inside of us a desire to live. And God put inside of us a desire to live and to fight to live. We love life. And that's why Paul will say to the Philippian group, you know, I'm torn between two things. I know if I go up there, wherever heaven is, I know if I die, it's going to be what? It's going to be good. But I also want to do what? <clears throat> Stay here with you because that's going to be good. You know, so it, th th that's a natural thing. I I'm not quite ready yet in, in that sense. But when it does come time, 
like the friend that you have told us about over and over again now from Clinton, whose family has now been called in. This is not, this is not the end. You know, it's not the end. Because if you walk in the light, the blood of Jesus keeps on cleansing. You keep wearing those robes of white, and I've gone way too long. I need to just stop. But everybody got it? I think, though, we need to focus the word if. If's a conditional statement. So there's some people who are like, well, I did all that. I got in the water, and I'm good to go. Like, well, but that's not what it's saying here. Yeah, that, that, that's not what he's saying here. He's right. This book is written to whom? It's written to believers. It's written to Christians. And he's saying, if you claim that you're in this and you're walking in the world and fellowship of the world, you're just, you're just spewing lies. You're living a lie. But if you're walking in the light, if, the blood's going to keep cleansing you. That, that's such a major distinction. So we'll come back to that next week and we will... Uh, We'll make our way on through that a little bit more, but he's going to tell us how to walk in the light. He's going to tell us what he expects and so forth. But isn't that powerful? I mean, I went a couple minutes along, but isn't it powerful to think? Uh, and it's challenging to think. Uh, and it's, as we used to say in the old days, give me a tall drink. Remember that? Nobody remembers going to Dairy Queen King and saying, I want a tall drink. Or a short drink. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> okay, so lar large, and, large and small, okay? I want a tall one. <laughs> so, so that's kind of, we had a tall, I was going to say we have a tall order to fill. I was just going to say we have a large order to fill, okay? <laughs>